So good afternoon and welcome to today's colloquium. Uh, Sri was supposed to be chairing this colloquium today, but he's out of town and he asked me to chair it and introduce our speaker today. Uh, but before I do that, I should probably introduce myself because some of you may not know who I am. Uh, my name is Tim Pearson. Uh, until a few years ago, I was a research professor here at Caltech uh, in radio astronomy uh, and at the Orange Valley Radio Observatory. But at the beginning of 2020, uh, funding was tight, so I decided to take retirement at that point. Uh, I thought I would carry on working much the same way, but just not get paid for it. Uh, but my retirement coincided with the start of a pandemic. Uh, so the world changed, my world changed, and whole world changed. I think there's no correlation there, but well, there's a correlation. I don't hope there's no causal correlation. Uh, so it's nice to be back and to see some of you face to face. I've been sitting at home in front of Zoom meetings for the last two and a half years. Uh, our speaker today is Kieran Cleary, uh, who is a senior scientist here at Caltech in, in Cahill. Uh, I hope most of you know him already. Uh, he he's, uh, runs the Cahill Radio Astronomy Lab downstairs and he's also an associate director of Owens Valley Radio Observatory. He's a specialist in uh, radio astronomy instrumentation and has spent his career developing instruments on the frontier of what is possible with radio astronomy, uh, pushing back those frontiers. And he's that rare person who has a, the, the technical skills, instrumental skills, and also can apply them to these cutting edge projects in astronomy and cosmology. Uh, his, his initial training, his undergraduate training, was in uh, electrical engineering at University College Dublin. Then he took his PhD at Droddell Bank, uh, Man University of Manchester in England, uh, where he worked on an instrument, of a, a instrument called a very small array, which was used to one of the early instruments measuring early interferometer measurements of the cosmic background, background radiation. Uh, we persuaded him to come here to JPL and later to Caltech uh, in 19, sorry, 2004. Uh, and since then, he's been working on many projects here uh, and developing new instruments. So he, he initially worked with Tony Reedhead on and an international collaboration, a big project called QUIET, uh, which was a focal plane array of radio, coherent radio receivers, polarimeters for measuring the CMB, which was deployed at Caltech's site at Shachnan Tor in the Atacama Desert. Uh, and he's also built receivers, well, he, he built the receivers for that, and he's also built receivers for the uh, Argus array on uh, the three millimeter array on the, at the focus, uh, sorry, at, on the Green Bank Telescope in, in West Virginia. And he's worked on a number of other projects, but today he's going to talk about his current project, uh, CO map, uh, the CO mapping array project, uh, which is using state of the art uh, radio, radio instrumentation to measure the integrated emission of carbon monoxide from galaxies over a very wide range of redshift. So over to you, Kieran. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Sam, for the nice introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today to give you an update on progress with the CO Mapping Array project. So today I'm going to try and motivate the science behind the project. I'm going to describe the instrument and a five-year survey that we're about halfway through. Um, I'll present some early science results based on the first year of observing, and then we'll look to the future and what we can expect from the experiment in the years ahead. There we go. So before I begin, though, I'd like to acknowledge that what I'm talking about today is the work of lots of people, all of whom have made very important contributions to the overall project. This slide summarizes, uh, summarizes the collaboration structure, the various institutions and the people at them, um, and just give you a flavor of what each, the role of each institution is here in green, kind of summarizing that here at Caltech, the PI institution, we played a major role in the design and construction of the instrument. We operated at Owens Valley. 
Um, so we're, we're, we, we operate the experiment. Um, in terms of the science, we're focusing on the uh, science potential for the combination of two data sets. One is the CEO fluctuations from galaxies at Redshift 3, and the other then is um, the catalog from a, a, a survey of Lyman alpha emitters overlapping in the same volume. Uh, the uh, CO data analysis, oh, I should say that the other uh, contributors to the instrument were uh, JPL Maryland and Miami, all of whom made uh, important contributions to various subsystems. Uh, the CO data analysis is led from the University of Oslo and the University of Manchester performs the same role for our galactic science components that I'll describe later. The CO modeling is led from NYU with collaborators at CETA, Geneva and Stanford, and then Princeton University also uh, collaborate on the galactic science. So I'm going to try and, and uh, convince you today that the CO map, Mapping Array project provides a powerful and complementary way to probe our cosmic history. So this cartoon summarizes that history. It, it tells a story that, that by now is, is very familiar. We have an expanding cooling universe filled with mostly hydrogen at early times. This eventually condenses around dark matter seeds to form the first stars and galaxies. These then ionize the surrounding intergalactic medium to form bubbles of ionized gas that merge until the intergalactic medium is entirely ionized and the neutral hydrogen survives just in self-shielded regions of individual galaxies. So that's a very nice story, but the problem with it, of course, is that uh, much of the events that I described and that are depicted remain unobserved. And so our ideas about them are uh, correspondingly unconstrained. We have good ideas about um, uh, the state of things at the very extremes of that cosmic timeline. Uh, we, know, we know what the, uh, the surface of last scattering of CMB photons looks like from observations of the CMB, and that provides an integral constraint on the optical depth to reionization. And then uh, at the other end, starting from observations of the local universe, we've been steadily pushing out, of course, with galaxy surveys, um, both wide area surveys and deep observations of small fields. Nevertheless, significant questions remain about reionization, specifically, um, I mean, we think we have a good idea about the timeline of the end of reionization or between redshifts five and six, but we're much, much less certain about the onset and duration of reionization and even the nature of the ionizing sources. Now, we believe that star forming galaxies must play an important role and that the faintest members of this population have to do uh, dominate the ionizing budget. We know that from the steepness of UV luminosity functions at this redshift. So if we really want to understand the process of reionization, we need to be able to trace and constrain the properties of these star forming galaxies down to their faintest limits. Of course, this is difficult at reionization. Uh, galactic, uh, gravitational lensing and deep Hubble imaging are just starting to give us a handle on these faint galaxy populations. And JWST, of course, will help. But what we really need is a way to trace large numbers of these galaxies uh, at high redshift. Then if we look a little further ahead and see how the story of star formation plays out in cosmic timescales, um, we, we, we can, uh, this, is, this is represented or summarized by this plot of the volume density of star formation um, versus redshift. One of the most significant facts we've learned about this over the last two decades is the fact that once star formation starts, it steadily increases until it reaches a peak and then declines towards present day. And the redshift at which it reaches a peak is around redshift two, and the period around this peak is known as the Epoch of Galaxy Assembly, where over half of the universe's stars were formed. This picture is quite uncertain at high redshifts because it relies on rest frame UV observations of rare ultraluminous galaxies with significant corrections for, for dust obscuration that become increasingly uncertain at high redshift. And so it's really quite uncertain just how much dust obscured star formation we're missing at high redshift. One way we can potentially get a handle on this is to use information from the cosmic, uh, cosmic infrared background, which folds in emission from galaxies both bright and faint. Um, but because it's continuum emission, there are degeneracies involved in trying to locate that emission in the line of sight. So that's illustrated by this figure that again shows in red the volume density of star formation in the Meadow and Dickinson points. And then in blue, we have two models for contributions um, from the cosmic infrared background. And both of these models are equally consistent with the data, but they predict very different contributions at high redshift. So one thing that ties together all of the questions uh, that, I, that I mentioned is the need to blindly trace or trace with that bias the emission from galaxies, both bright and faint, but in a way that allows us to access large volumes of the universe across cosmic time. So in what follows, I'm going to describe such a technique and then explain how we're trying to use that technique in the CO mapping array project. So typically when we want to trace galaxies in an unbiased way, we perform a blind galaxy survey. So on the left, there's a, 
simulation of a, of a galaxy distribution with galaxies in gray over a two and a half degree squared field. And if we wanted to trace the galaxies in that, in that area with something like the VLA and do a blind galaxy survey, it would take thousands of hours to detect just the brightest 1% of sources shown in red. So that's a technique that doesn't scale very well with, um, with volume. However, if we relax the requirement to detect each galaxy individually and instead make a, make a blurrier image with a coarser resolution, um, this blurrier image will be sensitive to all of the aggregate emission in the line of sight from galaxies both bright and faint. So if we do this with spectral, um, spectral line emission from galaxies, this is known as a spectral line intensity map. So clearly we lose information about individual galaxies, but we gain the ability to make a statistical statement about the uh, population of galaxies as a whole. And typically we express that the statistical statement in the form of a power spectrum shown on the right. And for galaxies, that power spectrum has two components, one due to clustering of galaxies on large scales. And then there's a scale independent shot noise from the stochastic bright end of the luminosity function. And that dominates on small scales. So unlike the cosmic infrared background, these measurements, spectral line intensity mapping measurements, um, can be located in the line of sight. And so the spectral bandwidth of our instrument, together with the field of view on the sky, defines a cosmic volume over which we can trace the properties of galaxies. So if we take two slices of this cosmic volume on the top panels, one perpendicular to the line of sight, so in the spatial direction, and one parallel to the line of sight in the spectral direction. So I'm showing here those two slices with uh, a simulation of dark matter halos. And if we observe those, uh, if we observe spectral line emission from galaxies hosted by those halos, we're of course doing it with a real instrument, one that has finite spatial and spectral resolution. And so the measurement we make is this blurrier image spatially shown on the lower left. Uh, and then of course, also we're uh, limited by the finite spectral resolution of our instrument. And so we'll convolve the emission in the line of sight with that, with that uh, finite channel width as well. So again, we're losing information about individual galaxies, but if you sort of squint and compare the two, you can see that we retain information about the distribution of galaxies on large scales. So if you've heard of this technique before, spectral line intensity mapping, chances are that it was in the context of 21 centimeter cosmology. So in this case, the line tracer that is used is the 21 centimeter spin flip transition of neutral hydrogen, which at redshifts prior to reionization exists in the intergalactic medium and after reionization survives in self-shielded regions of individual galaxies. So essentially, uh, there are a number of experiments targeting these two regimes. Um, on the, the reionization side, we have overall LWA, HERA, LOFAR, and the planned SKA low. These experiments are all essentially tracing the evolution of the neutral intergalactic medium as reionization progresses. After reionization, these experiments are essentially tracing galaxies, but in a way that allows them to cover large cosmic volumes efficiently. And so they're attempting to measure the Baryon acoustic oscillations on scales of around 150 megaparsecs. Examples of these experiments include CHIME, HIREX, and SKA MID. Of course, we're not restricted to using 21 centimeter as the line tracer for intensity mapping. In fact, in 2011, here at Caltech, there was a workshop hosted by the Keck Institute for Space Studies that really injected a lot of energy into the idea of using, uh, of using other lines. The lines that were uh, discussed at that time included carbon monoxide, ionized carbon, or C+, and a host of optical lines, including lime and alpha. So these are tracing a range of uh, physical conditions. Again, 21 centimeter prior to reionization is tracing the neutral IGM. After reionization is tracing galaxies. All of these other lines are also tracing galaxies in one way or another. They also span a very wide range in observed frequencies, ranging from VHF radio for 21 centimeter all the way to optical. And of course, there are corresponding variations in, in atmospheric capacity, in galactic foreground levels, and the presence of interloper lines. And so they all have different um, observing conditions and different kinds of systematics to, to deal with. It's worth noting that Caltech has a major involvement in a number of these experiments, apart from 21 centimeter. Uh, SphereX, of course, is tracing these optical lines. An experiment called TIME is using ionized carbon to trace galaxies. And then, of course, the main thing I want to talk about today, which is COMAP, which is using carbon monoxide as a line tracer in a spectral line intensity mapping experiment. So for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to describe COMAP. COMAP. I'll describe the, uh, the instrument and uh, our survey and then look at some early science results and then look to the future uh, in terms of what we can expect. So why use CO and why not some of these other lines? They all have their pros and cons. Uh, CO is a very well-known tracer of dense gas. So we're tracing uh, the fuel for star formation when we trace CO. And so that, that's, what we're, that's how we're tracing star forming galaxies. 
If we look at this plot on the upper right, we can see that uh, the CO luminosity correlates very well with the proxy for the star formation rate, namely the far infrared luminosity. This is a correlation that holds across a very wide range in redshift and galaxy type. CO has been, it's, it's a bright line. It's been detected at high significance in individual galaxies, as shown on the plot on the lower left, uh, which summarizes CO line detections. Um, at reionization, it tells a story that's complementary to 21 centimeter. So 21 centimeter is tracing the neutral, uh, the neutral gas, whereas carbon monoxide is tracing the ionizing sources themselves. And so that's a very complementary picture. Other lines, of course, will also trace star formation, but unlike those lines, carbon monoxide has a nice property that it emits in a ladder of line transitions, illustrated on the lower right. So starting at around 115 gigahertz, depending on the physical conditions, um, a number of, of individual tr transitions are available. And this allows us to measure different transitions from the same galaxies, and then we can cross correlate. And this allows us to pull out a signal in the presence of, of varying systematics. Different receivers may have different systematics, and so cross correlation can be robust against those systematics. If we detect a signal in autocorrelation of any one of these lines, cross-correlation allows us to validate the origin of that signal in high redshift galaxies. So that's a nice property of carbon monoxide. Uh, the, the observed um, wavelengths for, for observations targeting galaxies emitting these lines uh, range from centimeter to millimeter. And so we can take advantage of atmospheric windows and relatively low RFI levels. And then uh, compared to, for example, 21 centimeter, these, at these wavelengths are very relatively low um, galactic foreground levels. So CO map, it's an intensity mapping experiment, as I said, but it, it's an array, not an interferometric array, but a focal plane array. So rather than using multiple receivers on different dishes and cross-correlating those, we have a focal plane array that combines um, a number of receivers in the focal plane of a single dish. Ultimately, to uh, access the full range of redshifts, we will need a, a measurement from space outside of the atmospheric windows to do all sky measurements. Uh, we'll need receivers with thousands of elements and very broadband digital backends. But as a first step, we built a Pathfinder instrument focused on redshift three science, um, aimed at testing the technologies and the, te and the techniques that we will need to push this, um, this uh, new technique uh, and use it at the epoch of realization. So this illustrates our timeline. As I mentioned, we first started thinking about a CO mapping array um, experiment in 2011 after the Keck workshop. After that, we did some technology development funded by, the, the, by, by KISS. And then in 2015, we won an NSF award that allowed us to build a Pathfinder, which was ready for science in 2019. And that kickstarted a five-year survey uh, that we're about halfway through. And the early science results that I'll mention later on are all based on our first roughly a year of observing that we refer to as season one. So our Pathfinder instrument, we observe from 26 to 34 gigahertz. And on the plot on the top right, you can see the observed frequency of the three lowest transitions of carbon monoxide versus the redshift of the emitting galaxies, the emitting source. And so in a frequency range from 26 to 34 gigahertz, we are sensitive to C1 to zero from redshift three. We also have a fainter contribution around less than 10% of the total from galaxies of redshift six to eight. But for our, um, for our, our Pathfinder science, we're focused on the redshift three science. That's where our strong, strongest signal is. And so we're aiming to detect, constrain or detect the power spectrum of, of uh, fluctuations of carbon monoxide from galaxies at redshift three, and then use that to infer a constraint on the molecular gas abundance near the peak of cosmic star formation. And we'll do this with, um, with a technique that's sensitive to all of the emission from galaxies, both bright and faint, in a way that's relatively insensitive to obscuration, dust, dust obscuration. So a little about the instrument, as I said, it's a 19 C. Single pixel, it's a 19 feet single polarization uh, receiver. So we have 19 feeds um, that are at ambient temperature. Um, this, the limit, the size of that was essentially set by the size of the focal plane area of the telescopes that we're using. These are 10.4 meter dishes at Owens Valley. So the figure on the lower right shows our feeds at ambient temperature. There um, are detectors are based on high electron mobility transistors. They come in chip form shown on the top. So these are, these are transistors. And in this chip form, there are a number of discrete stages of amplification. They come in a chip form, which is, which is easy to replicate. And uh, there's a number of, of other um, 
there's, there's other circuitry on the chip that provides bias for the transistors. And then we, we take these chips and we package them in a brass package uh, shown, shown uh, just below that. And these brass packages then are our low noise amplifier modules and they represent the uh, detector element for our receiver. Uh, this figure here then shows the, uh, the LMAs. You can't take them out, but there are 19 LMAs here in the same hex pattern of feeds. So when the signal enters the feeds, it encounters a polarizer. This rejects uh, one, one circular polarization, and we do that to mitigate a known systematic. That's um, baseline ripple caused by reflections between the receiver and the secondary dish. Um, and so by rejecting one circular polarization, we can mitigate that systematic. This is one undesirable aspect of on-axis optics that we have in our telescope. Um, and then the signals encounter our, our cooled LNAs, and then they, the amplified signals exit the cryostat um, and are mixed in units on the exterior of the cryostat. So there are mixers outside the cryostat, and these mix the signal to an intermediate frequency of 2 to 10 gigahertz. They then traverse long cables and enter a side cabin. That's a little cabin that's located on the azimuth platform of the, of the telescope. Um, inside that side cabin, they encounter a second mixer. We quadrature mix the signals to produce in-phase and quadrature signals. Uh, we do this. Uh, the, the 8 gigahertz bandwidth of the, of the signal is split into two 4 gigahertz bands. And then we, we perform digital sideband separation within each of those 4 gigahertz bands. And we do this inside a, a roach. We use a roach 2 unit to digitize our signals. And then the signals are, are, are uh, separated, the sidebands are separated digitally. So all of our you know, processing is done on the telescope, including the digitization. Um, it's worth noting, I think this is the widest frequency range for any operational instrument where digital sideband separation is performed. If we did that using analog electronics, we'd be very happy to get 20 dB of image rejection. In fact, we get 40 to 50 dB of image rejection as I show in the top right. That, that um, shows for a single feed, and one, one band, one four gigahertz band, it shows the image rejection that we obtain, which as you can see is in the 40 to 50 dB range. Um, this is very stable. We calibrate this infrequently, typically after a power cut, a power failure. And the lower plot shows the stability of the mean image rejection for a single feed over a period of about a month. So in terms of other performance metrics, uh, the histogram here, histograms, the system temperatures for all feeds and scans in, um, in our season one. So scan is a unit of observation time, typically around 12 minutes. So we achieve a median system temperature of around 44 Kelvin. And the variation that you see here is largely due to observing at different elevations. We observe our fields between elevations of 35 and 65 degrees. So we achieved our target um, system temperature, which was nice. Uh, this, these bars here summarize or the compares uh, the total instantaneous process bandwidth that we obtain with SEOMAP with other similar instruments, other focal plane array spectrometers. And so if you take the eight gigahertz that we record every 20 milliseconds from each of the 19 feeds, um, that results in 152 gigahertz of total instantaneous process bandwidth. And you can see that it outperforms by a factor of a few, um, these other instruments at frequencies ranging from uh, K-band, the GBT K-band focal plane array to the two terahertz instrument on SOFIA. I'm not aware of any other operational instrument that outperforms COMAP and that metric, but if you, if you do know, please let me know. Then in the kind of upper right, you can see a, a, our beam footprint determined through observations of Jupiter. We, we have a four and a half arc minute resolution at 30 gigahertz and our beam footprint on the sky, there's 12 arc minutes between each beam and um, at its widest, the footprint is about a degree across. Our modeled and measured beams agree very well. So for two frequencies, these two solid curves represent the model beams, and then the dots represent different azimuthal slices of the, uh, of, of the measured beam. They agree very well. Um, and then finally, this is a spectral line uh, experiment, but we don't measure any single spectral line at any high significance from any individual galaxy. So in order to confirm that we have our frequency mapping correct in our digital back end. We made some observations of radio recombination lines in the galaxy and they all appear at the correct frequency. So that was a nice engineering confirmation. So now a bit about our survey. I mentioned we're in the middle of a five-year observing campaign that started in July 2019. We're observing three fields. They were selected to maximize our observing efficiency, so they're spread out in RA. Uh, we also avoid bright point sources. Uh, and then crucially, we selected these fields to overlap with the only galaxy survey that provides spectroscopic redshifts in our volume. 
This is a HETEX uh, dark energy survey. It's surveying Lyman alpha emitters, redshifts one to three. Uh, it's doing this with the virus integral field spectrograph on the Hobby Eberly telescope. And actually, one of our fields, uh, you kind of see in the, the top right hand plot, uh, after we defined our fields, HETEX slightly changed their field definitions, and so it lies outside the nominal survey. But we do intend to follow that up with the virus instrument once the main survey is complete. So we observe our, our three CO fields uh, for about 18 hours per day. And when we're not observing those, we observe uh, point source calibrators and also um, fields for our galactic science, which I'll describe later on. So in terms of how we, how we um, observe, um, we essentially observe by scanning uh, the telescope in some motion and letting the field drift through. And then once it's drifted through, we repoint ahead of the field and do the same again. And so our observations consist of a series of independent scans uh, separated by repointings. And so when it comes to choosing the scan motion, we had two that we used in our season one. One is a lissajou, where we're essentially moving the telescope sinusoidally in azimuth and elevation at the same time. Uh, and that produces a scanning pattern that you can see in the top right. So that has a nice property that it provides good cross-linking for map making. Um, because we're moving in azimuth and elevation, we get a fairly you know, more complex ground, ground contribution and of course the imprint of the atmosphere. Um, the other option is a constant elevation scan where we're simply, it's a, it's a one dimensional lissajou. We're moving the telescope sinusoidally, but in azimuth only at a fixed elevation. Um, and that has the property that the ground contribution is essentially constant over the course of the scan, but then the cross-linking is poorer, particularly at transit. And so because it was difficult to decide which of these was optimal at the beginning, we alternated daily between these two scan types. Um, the lower plots show examples of raw data taken using these two scans. Constant elevation scan here. So here's this is a raw spectrometer data for a single feed averaged over one sideband versus time. And so we're we're performing a constant elevation scan and then repointing um, once the field has drifted through. And the signal is roughly constant um, for that scanning type. And then on the right, you can see the Lissajou scan where you see this the imprint of the sinusoidal motion in elevation being imprinted on the on the signal because of the varying atmospheric opacity. As it turns out, when it came to analyze uh, season one, we found that there was a much higher level of contamination in our Lissajou scans compared to constant elevation scans. And so we, for our season one results, um, we focused on the constant elevation scans. And then after season one, we, we dropped observing in the Lissajou type scans. Uh, we think this is due to a, to a more complex ground contribution. And so we'll return to this issue. Uh, but for the moment, we're just using con constant elevation scans. So now a little about the pipeline. Um, so if we take one of these scans, take the time order data and do a Fourier transform, we get a power spectrum. Um, so on the right, we, um, I'm showing the power spectrum for, for a single, um, single scan. And so what we see here is kind of what we expect to see, which is long time scale correlations caused by you know, gain receiver fluctuations and atmospheric contributions, flattening to white noise on shorter time scales or higher frequencies. And so the purpose of the pipeline then is to, um, one of the purposes is to remove these long timescale correlations. And so we apply a successive series of filters, the cumulative effect of which is shown on the right. Um, first thing we do is we low pass filter and we remove the mean signal. Um, we do this for every frequency channel and that applies um, a constant kind of relative calibration across frequencies. Then we remove the, if we're doing a Lissajou scan, we remove the atmospheric, the, the imprint of the atmospheric elevation changes. Um, there's a number of other filters. One important one is what we call the poly filter. So that's taking at every time sample, uh, the, the data organized in frequency and fitting a low order polynomial to those data. And that removes things that are correlated across frequencies typically. Um, so that's any broadband signal, any continuum signal, but also one of ref noise, which is highly correlated in frequency. And then we also do a principal component analysis. We do this across all feeds and that uh, removes signals that are correlated across feeds. And so you can see that by the time we get to the end of our uh, pipeline at the very um, lowest trace, we removed essentially all of the um, non time correlations and our, um, our signal is our, our data are essentially very, very quiet at that point. So the output of the pipeline then is a series of cubes, a series of maps um, in each field and at each field, in each field, then we have a series of maps, uh, slices in each, at each frequency. 
So our, our native resolution is two megahertz, but for science, we use a coarser resolution of around 31 megahertz. And that's optimized to the expected line width. So we have these three cubes that we've obtained of temperature fluctuations in our, in our volume. And the challenge then is to, is to estimate from that the three-dimensional power spectrum that we can then use to constrain models and, and compare with, with um, other observational constraints. So when we estimate these, these power spectra, we need to do it in a way that takes account of the uh, selective sensitivity to spatial scale that we've imposed through our pipeline and our instrumental response. And we express this or, or show this in, in the, in the uh, form of a transfer function. So that's a two-dimensional plot from the middle on the top. Um, so here we've decomposed um, the transfer function in, in spatial scale in directions uh, uh, perpendicular to the line of sight, that's a spatial direction, and parallel to the line of sight, so that's a spectral direction. And the color scale here then represents the amount of filtering that is done in the, by the combined effects of the pipeline and the instrument. So if we consider the spatial direction, first of all, we, we lose information on the very smaller scales uh, due to um, the instrument, due to the, um, well, the instrumental response, our beam, we're insensitive to scales smaller than the beam. And then the larger scales, our finite field size determines the largest scale in the sky that we're sensitive to in the spatial direction. And then the spectral direction, we have similarly have uh, a finite channel bandwidth and a finite bandwidth. And then our pipeline, uh, the, the filtering, the low-pass filtering and so on that we do also um, imposes, um, reduces our sensitivity to certain scales. However, we do retain sensitivity to the scales of interest. And so if we go back to our schematic of the two components of the power spectrum, these gray bars represent the scales to which we retain sensitivity um, after the pipeline and instrument, instrumental effects are taken into account. So primarily, COMAP is probing the clustering scales of galaxies of region three. So then taking these effects into account, we can estimate our power spectra shown on the right. So we have three colors here, one for each field, and then the black is the combination of the three. So these are all based on season one observations, 13 months. Um, in that time, we don't expect to detect any cosmological signal. So what we, what we do want to see is the, the flat power spectrum with fluctuations that are consistent with Gaussian random noise, um, indicating that we suppressed any systematics below the level of the white noise. So, so that's indeed what we do see. So we can take this power spectrum and express it as a constraint um, over all scales. And that's, that season one upper limit is shown in pink on the right. And also shown are various curves representing different models from the literature for the expected level of the signal. So with our season one upper limit, we exclude the two brightest models. Of the remaining models, we have one model that's our fiducial model. It's, it's, um, it arose from our collaboration, originally uh, from Tony Lee at Stanford. Uh, it's been updated since then. We've, we've um, We've updated the model, incorporating various observational constraints that have been that have emerged since then. The first being uh, from the Cold Z survey, that's a blind survey of uh, carbon monoxide em emission um, at redshift three. And then the other one called COPS is a second uh, CO intensity mapping experiment. So this actually used Karma and it used archival Karma data and then uh, car new Karma observations taken in the last months of operation. Um, and based on the scales available to the Karma array, uh, use a subset of the Karma array actually, to use the, I think the SEA antennas. Um, and based on the scales accessible from the SEA, COPS is primarily probing uh, smaller scales, so the shot noise part of the, the power spectrum. And so the two constraints then that we updated our models with were COZI and COPS. Then in blue, we're showing the uh, expected sensitivity um, at the end of our five-year survey based on the performance during season one and then also based on some improvements we've made since then. We expect to, based on that forecast, we expect to detect the fiducial model uh, with a signal to noise of nine across all scales and that drops to five for the weakest model, the faintest model shown. So from our first uh, season of observations, we don't have enough sensitivity to constrain our fiducial model, to, to constrain that model that predicts the power spectrum to takes, takes us from halo mass to CO luminosities. So we can't constrain that model yet, but what we can do is try and tease apart the relative contributions of the two components of the power spectrum, the clustering and the shot noise components. So with some simplifications, we can represent that observed power spectrum as some scaling of the underlying matter power spectrum plus the shot noise component. And so on the right, we can see likelihood contours for various combinations of data. So COPS alone, as I mentioned, is primarily probing the shot noise component. So it doesn't obtain a very tight constraint on the clustering amplitude. 
But with our season one data alone, we've obtained an order of magnitude improvement in that constraint on the clustering amplitude. And then if you combine both data sets, you get a nice constraint in both, both scales. So if we take our constraint on the clustering amplitude and make some assumptions about the bias, that's the extent to which the CO luminosity is actually tracing the underlying matter. We can derive a constraint on the average temperature of CO, uh, average CO temperature of galaxies uh, redshift three. And then by further assuming uh, an alpha CO that's, uh, that relates the CO luminosity to the, to the gas, we can make, we can infer a constraint on the molecular gas abundance. So that constraint is shown as the green upper limit on the right in this plot of molecular gas abundance uh, versus redshift. Also shown are a number of other observational, existing observational constraints, and they form it, they, they fall into two classes. We have these red boxes that represent constraints from other line intensity mapping experiments. And then we have these points in gray that are derived from direct detection experiments, galaxy surveys that are tracing either CO or discontinuum. So you can see that they kind of spread out in the range of the, the, the range of the gas. Um, is represented by these two models um, that are kind of representative of the, the spread of, of molecular gas abundances that we see from these constraints. You'll see that the intensity mapping uh, constraints tend to lie above those from the direct detection experiments and surveys. This is consistent with the idea that intensity mapping is, is sensitive to galaxies that are too faint to be detected directly by galaxy surveys. And so um, one might expect to see more more gas, more emission from, from uh, intensity mapping experiments that you would see from derived from, from galaxy surveys. And then the filled green rectangles, so the forecasts for our end of five year uh, survey constraints uh, for, for each of these two models. So in everything that I've discussed so far, it's been about constraints that we can achieve on the auto power spectrum of, of galaxies of redshift three. So by auto power spectrum, I mean the power spectrum derived from autocorrelation of the temperature fluctuations and our volume. Um, that's, not the, that's not the only, um, that's not the, the only science that we can do, of course, and I'll talk about cross correlations that we can do. It's worth mentioning that there's no line intensity mapping experiment of any kind tracing any line, including 21 centimeter, that's made a solid detection of the auto, their, their auto power spectrum for that line. So, I'm going to return now to this, this idea of cross correlations. I mentioned that we've selected our fields to overlap with the galaxy survey, that's the HETEC survey of Lyman alpha emitters. Um, so there's a very rich range of science possibilities that we can, we can uh, work on with the combination of these two data sets. First of all, and kind of most, most simply, we can simply stack, we can stack the positions of, we can, we can stack, stack CO map voxels, that's our three dimensional pixels, on the locations of Lyman alpha. Um, galaxies from the Hetex catalog. Um, that could possibly allow us to get a high sig significance detection of the average CO temperature in our volume, the average CO temperature of Lyman alpha emitters, and investigate its evolution over, 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 over redshift. Um, and then by, you know, by binning these Lyman alpha emitters in different categories, we can investigate the gas properties, the average gas properties of Lyman alpha emitters. We can potentially identify CO bright clusters for uh, follow-up, for example, using ALMA. And then we can even possibly put a constraint on the high redshift contribution to our signal. So recall that I said that the dominant signal uh, for the Pathfinder is emission from galaxies at redshift three, but there's also a subdominant fainter less than 10% contribution from the CO two to one line originating in galaxies at, at redshift six to eight. And so if we take our uh, HETEX catalog and we mask all of the voxels containing those galaxies, then we can stack the residual voxels and try and use that to impose an upper limit on the possible emission or contribution from the high ridge of galaxies. So in addition to these stacking analyses, we can also of course do power spectrum uh, cross correlations and drive the, the cross power spectrum between the CO fluctuations and galaxies. So we can simply cross correlate our CO fluctuations with the catalog, the, the galaxy positions. There's a potential also to do the same analysis, but with the Lyman alpha emission fluctuation cube, that would give us access to larger scales uh, on the Lyman alpha side. So this plot on the right then kind of summarizes the state of play of constraints, intensity mapping constraints in galaxies at redshift three. In the upper half of that plot, we have the various existing observational constraints, and these are a combination of auto power spectrum constraints and also CO cross galaxy constraints. And so we have a cross 
the power uh, constraint from WMAP KA across SGSS quasars. There's the, the COPS results, the COPS auto power spectrum upper limit, and then the COPS cross galaxy constraint. And then we have our own season one uh, constraint in red. And then looking to the future, we anticipate um, significant detections of the CO auto power spectrum and the CO cross galaxy uh, power spectrum at various stages in our five-year survey. Not shown in the plot on the right is a preliminary study that we're doing here led by Delaney Dunn, a graduate student here in the department. This is a, um, a study involving a cross-correlation of our season one data with BOSS quasars. So apart from CO science, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the ancillary science that we're doing uh, with the instrument. We didn't design the Pathfinder to do continuum science. Um, our, our CO pipeline um, deliberately um, filters out any continuum signal. But nevertheless, our Pathfinder does occupy a unique niche in terms of galactic science. No other instrument combines its uh, spectral and spatial resolution with its sensitivity to large angular scale. And so with this uh, instrument, when we're not observing CO fields, so apart from the 18 hours where we observe CO, we observe galactic targets. One of these uh, targets is to perform a survey of the, uh, the galactic plane. Um, by the end of the five-year survey, we hope to have most of the northern plane covered. Um, we just recently released a preliminary result, which is a map of the plane. Um, it's a continuum map at in, in, in eight one gigahertz chunks between 26 and 34 gigahertz. Um, this is a, a combined map here shown on the top um, and showing some preliminary coverage, galactic uh, longitudes between 20 and 40. So with this map and these data, we can do some studies of the continuum emission in the plane. We can study um, supernova remnants and H2 regions. Some of these are outlined in boxes. There's also the potential to uh, do studies of the anomalous microwave emission. So this is a mission that's believed to originate in spinning dust grains. Um, it's a mission that is believed to peak or has been observed to peak at frequencies between 20 and 60 gigahertz. It was det detected as a, at the time, anomalous emission of galactic foregrounds uh, during early CMB studies. And so with our COMAP data, um, in this lower panel on the left, we're showing an example of the kinds of things we can do. Uh, so we can combine our COMAP data with data from other observations and surveys, and then we can spectrally decompose the various emission components. Um, so we have free-free emission uh, dominating at low frequencies, thermal dust at high frequencies, and then this other component peaking up around 30 gigahertz from the anomalous microwave emission. And so we're hoping that the, the unique capabilities of, of the Pathfinder will allow us to investigate this, uh, this component of emission. We're going to perform, um, well, we want to examine how the emission varies spectrally and spatially um, with, with varying physical condition. It's nice that we're doing this from Overo. This is the location from which that component was first discovered to be anomalous through observations by Tony Reedhead and Larry Cleach over 25 years ago. Then I mentioned earlier that observations of radio recombination lines provide a nice engineering confirmation, but of course, they're also contributing to our galactic science as well as making continuum maps. We can also make maps of these uh, radio recombination lines that will allow us to trace the warm ionized gas along the plane. So looking to the future then, the immediate future, of course, for the Pathfinder is to complete the five-year survey. But the Pathfinder was conceived as a proving ground for a more ambitious experiment, one that pushes back to the epoch of realization. So there is this subdominant contribution from redshift six to eight to our signal, but really to uh, detect this, this, the high redshift signal, we need to introduce a second receiver, one that operates between 12 and 20 gigahertz, and therefore is sensitive to the CO one to zero line from redshifts around five to nine. So we can do two things with this, this, this data set. We can do an autocorrelation of, of the high redshift CO one to zero line. And then we can also cross correlate from the regions of redshift overlap. And again, you know, if we detect an excess in the, um, in the CO one to zero autocorrelation, our cross correlation provides some additional immunity to systematics, um, to systematics that are peculiar to each receiver. And so the cross correlation provides some extra systematic immunity. And then it can also help to validate the origin of any excess that we detect in an autocorrelation in, in, in high redshift galaxies. So with the combination of these instruments, so this is you know, the new receiver plus the ongoing observations with the Pathfinder, uh, we can hope to trace the cold gas history of the universe. So if we take um, the molecular gas abundance plot that I showed earlier and now extend it out to redshift nine, and then extend these two models out as well, 
Um, we're showing in these filled rectangles, blue and orange, the kinds of constraints that we could hope to achieve with the fiducial survey using this combination of instruments that we call COMAP EOR. Of course, the, um, the level of the signal um, predicted by these two models is very different. Um, this, this science uh, mapping, they're tracing the cold gas history of the universe is a key science goal of future large facilities like the NGVLA. But galaxies performed with these instruments with their detection limits I will not be able to confirm or uh, rule out the existence of significant emission uh, and molecular gas in galaxies that are below their detection limit. And so these, these future galaxy surveys that are hoping to trace this gas history out to the epoch of realization really will need complementary um, intensity mapping observations to, to uh, distinguish between these two cases shown here on the right. Uh, the time scale then for COMAP EOR. Um, so I mentioned this will involve a 12 to 20 gigahertz receiver. Uh, unfortunately, we can't fit a, a useful number of these of, of these feeds of 12 to 20 gigahertz feeds in the focal plane of the 10 meter telescopes that we're using for, for the Pathfinder. So there are more of these 10 meter class telescopes at Owens Valley. So we could in principle field one of these receivers, but it wouldn't be sensitive enough because we don't have enough room in the focal plane for, for um, a focal plane array at these frequencies. So that means we're going to need a new telescope. Um, in principle, since we're thinking about new telescopes, it would be nice if it were off axis. That would help mitigate this systematic baseline ripple uh, between the receiver and the secondary. And so if it were off axis, we could consider a dual polarization receiver to make it significantly more sensitive. And it would also be nice if it were optimized for large format focal plane arrays. So it's actually uh, convenient that there's uh, such a new telescope is being built at the moment by NRAO as a um, prototype for NGVLA. And they, they've agreed to dedicate this telescope to COMAP EOR when they finish their own engineering verification measurements. And that's expected to be by, by 2026. And so um, as we continue with um, Pathfinder observations, our goal is to raise funds to build a receiver to field on this 18 meter offset fed dish when it becomes available to the project in 2026. I will mention in the closing uh, minutes of the um, talk that it's nice that we do have a future at Owens Valley, considering that we had a brush with an, a, a, a brush fire earlier this year, the airport fire, uh, which produced uh, some spectacular images shown here. So we can see the CO map dish on the right and the flames are alarmingly close. Thanks to uh, Observatory staff and, and uh, brave firefighters who worked through the night to keep the flames away. We survived actually unscathed apart from some damage to car lines. For those of you who know the observatory, that's the, the cottage. And some of you may have stayed. Um, but as I said, the, uh, the observatory survived, albeit with a, an interesting color scheme for some of the, the dishes due to the flame retardant. So I'll just, in the final minutes then, just advertise uh, some of our papers. If you want to know any more details on what I've spoken about today, please seek out our early science papers. These are these have been accepted for publication. They should be appearing um, within a month or so. Uh, I should say that apart from the ones led by myself and overall site director, James Lamb, they were all led by outstanding graduate students and postdocs. And we have an eighth paper led by Delaney Dunn here in the department uh, that I mentioned based on a, on a, a new analysis, a preliminary study of the cross correlation between CO fluctuations and Boss catalog. And then if you want to talk to anybody about the, apart from myself, of course, about the uh, results, uh, you'll find us at AAS. We have three talks on topics ranging from our early science results, uh, the future with CO map EOR, and then Delaney will be presenting a preliminary analysis, the results of that preliminary analysis between uh, CO map and, and Boss. And then we have a couple of posters, one on the galactic science, and then one for myself on the early science results in general. So I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kieran. Uh, I'm not sure how we can take questions from the online participants, but maybe we can start with any questions in the hall. What's the dominant term, the 44, uh, the P system, the histogram we showed, what's the dominant contribution? The dominant contribution there is, is the aperture. So yeah. the, yeah, the, the, so that, that spread of values is just used to observing two different amounts of aperture as we observe at elevations from 35 to 65 degrees. So that's the width and the central value? The central value is, I mean, you have about, um, 
you know, 16 Kelvin from the LMA, a few more Kelvin for the receiver, the atmosphere is about 10 Kelvin, the um, we've got some grand over sale of probably about four Kelvin. So the combination of that gives you around 44 Kelvin. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, it looked like you measured the brightness temperature of the CO with was a misled. It seems fairly high, actually, like you know, 25 degrees or something. Um, was that including some correction for the size of the galaxy or something? So, which plot are you thinking of? Uh, uh, this one? It's tracking it back to it. That's okay. This uh, that one. So we have we have this one, which is constraints on the average temperature time bias, and then we have power second constraints um, here. Well, for example, in the, in the first in the first slide, you just showed it looked like you had what fifteen or nothing. Going. Well, but, yes, uh, for the for the temperature time bias, and so it took the bias of you know two to three to bring that down. It's the, it's the average product of the temperature times of the time bias, which is just convenient way to compare the results from different experiments, not all of whom separate out into quantities. You didn't show any of the cross correlation with the optical catalog, did you? Uh, no. When, when will that be? Um, so, the thing I think will be shown is the preliminary constraints at uh, WAS. And you have a good signal noise on that? Um, yeah, it's, it's a preliminary study, so you'll have an upper limit. So this is using just to say a little bit more details. It's using just on the seal map side. It's just using our season one, so it's just the first 13 months. Um, since then, we have two and a half times more data in the can. We have a second generation pipeline that's actually squeezing more from the data. Um, so this is really what Delaney will be showing. It's really just to have the first first step. And then that, that's a that's a boss. Ultimately, we're going to do this petex with you know orders of a few times more more sources. Different sources, line altimeters, so there's interesting science to when we do the stacking, just in what we call the C, what we expect to see stacking AGM versus um, line altimeters. So you don't factor in, when you do that kind of stacking, you don't factor in the intensity of the optical lines. No, we're just stacking on position. Right. So, so, you know, there are more sophisticated analyses that we can do, just the, the most basic thing is just stacking. Um, yeah. But, uh, I mean, yeah, but, I mean, we, but weighting by the intensity of the optical line might be misleading because the same intensity variation. Yeah, I mean, you know, on, on small scales, the O will be emitted from dusty galaxies and alpha not. And so there's not going to be an anti correlation almost on small scales, but on larger scales, galaxies hopefully will trace other galaxies uh, given large enough scales. Um, and so, um, yeah, so we're not we're not using the we're not stacking the lamina alpha because we expect the lamina alpha to be right in CO. We're expecting them to trace uh, regions of over density. Another question right now. Is the 13 CO pack full or will you learn anything from it? Um, it would need a much more sensitive experiment. Even and, with and stacking. The, pardon me. Even with stacking. Um, yeah, but you said, well, maybe ultimately when we have our full five year and, and so on, we can stack on maybe line and a half positions from the full head deck catalog. Um, Patrick Bracey wrote a paper on on, uh, on comparing what we what we would learn from the two. Um, so it's it's kind of a far future thing really rather than something we expect to do with the past number. One, just one more question. Is there one project which is taking a nearby galaxy for which there is an existing CO map and then scanning that and seeing what you get in comparison? Um, like M51 or whatever. When you say scanning this? Yeah, well, using CO, using this technique. Well, I mean, galaxy where you know the structure of the CO. I mean, that's kind of, that's, that, that's not, and this technique will kind of deliberately not measure any individual galaxies at all. It's, it's going to be a statistical detection of the overall emission. And so that's that's kind of going away from this. This, this technique is. Uh, oh, I understand. Yeah. Show the efficacy of the technique. Um, 
mean, you observe the black and plain, but it'd be worth it. Yeah, I mean, essentially, I mean, I'm not sure what we would add for nearby galaxies. We would just make a low resolution. Um, well, the problem is you don't have the frequency coverage for C01 to zero low resolution. Uh, true. Yeah. yeah. Jamie Buck. Oh, hi. I hope you can hear me. Uh, nice talk, uh, Karen. Uh, you. My question was if you do data differencing tests like jackknives and what kind of jackknives you do in this three dimensional measurement? Yeah, we we haven't we've done some jackknives. Uh, they're described in in the in one of our early science papers. We haven't spent a lot of time on jackknives this time because that really only becomes important when we have a, a detection and we're trying to demonstrate that our detection is or the excess that we measure is not you know does not originate in systematics. Um, but the yeah the kinds um, I mean there's a wide variety you know splitting on uh, trying to split obviously on the kind of systematics that we that we know about these include standing waves um, we're looking at feet to feet differences uh, we can split on uh, elevation, comparing ground contributions. We can split on on you know on time, um, day night observations, and so on. Um, like our main our main systematic effects are you know we have low galactic foregrounds. We're not so worried about those. Our main systematics are really coming from atmospheric atmosphere ground standing waves. Obviously, is going to be a big one um, as we drill deeper. Um, so all of the ways in which we can separate those signals, they're the kinds of splits that we're thinking of doing. Well, thank you again, Kieran. Uh, we can have uh, further discussion of a slime and cheese on the patio, uh, but thank you again. <coughs> <coughs>